Speed up your rig with the Toshiba OCZ TR200 SSD. Experience ultra-fast performance packaged in a slim 2.5-inch form factor using 64-layer 3D NAND flash memory. Now available in 240, 480, and 960 gig capacities. Click on the link below for more info. All right guys, so this is part two, the follow-up to the Dan case build that I assembled for August PC of the month. I'm really excited to actually get this on the test bed, or not on the test bed, but this is the test bed. Uh, I'm excited to test it today, run some benchmarks, take a look at thermals and stuff like that. Um, but first, I wanted to give you guys a quick update on the system itself because some things have transpired since part one that I think are worth talking about in case you guys plan to build something like this yourself. For starters, when I first put this system together, everything fit more or less perfectly. But shortly after, the side panel that goes on the side of the, the CPU here um, started to pop off at the top because there are no physical screws at the top of either of these side panels. They're just these push pins, Lee and Lee's push pin technology. I'm not gonna call it technology. They're just little push pin tabs or little plasticky things, um, but they started to pop off uh, mainly because of the AIO tubes, they were they were causing clearance issues. They're actually protruding from, from this right side of the case a bit too far, and that pressure was just causing the, the side panel to pop open. The reason why the tubes are sticking out so much, however, uh, was because of the Trident Z heat spreaders being so tall. They were forcing this part of the tube area to push out even more. So you can see I've actually swapped out that memory kit for some Ripjaws 5 sticks of the same capacity and speed. But even these sticks are too tall, however, so I'll probably have to swap these out for something even more low profile like uh, Corsair's Vengeance LPX or maybe Crucial Ballistic Sport or something like that. In the meantime, the side panel does fit on if I put a small piece of tape at the top. It's definitely an eyesore and quite literally a band-aid on the situation, on the problem, uh, but uh, it's the best I can do for now until we get that memory swapped out. The other issue, a little quirk here, uh, let me go ahead and turn this system around for you. So on this side, we clearly have our graphics card and a better look at the 92 millimeter AIO with a knock to a fan right there. The issue here, and you guys probably saw this if you watched my Best Buy Cooler Master vlog video, which you should check out definitely if you haven't seen it yet, it's pretty cool, um, is the, uh, the the power supply cables, the way that the power supply is oriented, the, the cables actually plug in from the bottom of the unit and in transport sometimes those cables get jostled around and will actually hang a little bit lower than they should and that'll actually interfere with the fan blade on that fan causing it to not spin up which is obviously detrimental to our CPU temperatures so uh, what I'm thinking here is swapping out the cables for some custom uh, cables and, and just kind of redoing the whole thing with some some nice sleeved uh, cabling and that'll also clean up the look inside the system even though it doesn't matter too much it's just an aesthetic thing but I think that'll probably solve our issue once and for all once we get uh, some custom cables that are also maybe a bit more flexible than these stock cables here so perhaps we'll do a part three you know usually for pimp my pc or wow, for, usually for uh, pc of the month we'll have a two-part thing going but maybe we'll do a part three uh, just so i can swap out the memory fix the side panel issue and the cable issue uh, and maybe a couple other things that we'll talk about in a moment. But with that said, why don't we talk about the actual testing? That's what we're here to discuss mainly today. Uh, starting with the testing methodology, I decided to run both the CPU and the GPU fully stuck. My reasoning is pretty obvious here. It's a small case. There isn't a whole lot of cooling potential, even though we've got an AIO, which sounds great on paper. It's still just a 92 millimeter AIO. And the CPU, the 2700X, is a 105 watt TDP chip. So it, uh, it's definitely not the coolest of the bunch. And we've got a whole eight cores and 16 threads on there after all. So I decided to run stock. The CPU is pretty much at that point just being handled by uh, the Sensamai technology. I'm kind of leaving it in, uh, in AMD's hands here with XFR2 Precision Boost 2. And what I was typically seeing during gameplay was an all-core boost to four gigahertz thereabouts um, which is perfectly fine for me temperatures however were not so ideal we were actually getting around 79 to 80 degrees celsius on average that was kind of where we were hovering uh, within gta 5 after about you know half an hour to 45 minutes but it actually spiked up to 88 c at one point which had to have caused some amount of throttling, even if it was just for a second or two, because the maximum uh, rated temp for this chip is 85 degrees Celsius if you look on AMD's website. So uh, that's definitely something that I want to keep a closer eye on, and it also leads me to believe that perhaps the Ryzen 7 2700 non-X would have been a better fit for this system. Now that I'm looking at the, the low temperatures and stuff and had a chance to play with it, um, that's, a, that's a 65 watt TDP chip. It runs at a lower clock speed out of the box, lower turbos and all that, so perhaps that would be better 
suited for a rig like this. Again, something that we can explore in part three. Our GPU, on the other hand, did a pretty nice job in comparison. We saw temperatures range anywhere from 79 to 83 degrees Celsius with a max of 84. It's definitely not the coolest, I'll admit. Uh, however, this is the smallest cooler I've ever seen a manufacturer put onto a GP102, so still very impressive. We're getting a lot of performance out of this thing nonetheless. The other thing to note is that 84 degrees Celsius is still well under the TJ Maxx for this particular card, and we were still seeing a GPU core clock of 1835 at those temperatures, whereas the uh, the official rated boost clock for this particular card is 1620 megahertz. So, so we were not only uh, not thermal throttling, but we were actually getting a much higher boost clock than what this card's rated for on the box. Our GPU and CPU pairing, however, might not be a 100% match made in heaven. I did notice GPU utilization was hovering anywhere from 87 to 92% as opposed to, you know, the ideal 99 or 100%. That could be indicative of some CPU bottlenecking. Don't get me wrong, the 2700X is a fantastic CPU, but the 1080Ti is a blazing fast GPU that requires pretty much cream of the crop CPU performance in order to keep up with it. We'd probably see less bottlenecking had we paired this card with something like Intel's Core i7-8700K. But at the same time, that chip runs a lot hotter on average than the 2700X, and in the case this thermally constrained, that'd probably be a bad idea. So all that considered, I'm actually okay with taking the minor performance hit, especially since we're able to cram all this high-end hardware into a relatively tiny footprint. Moving right along here, I was able to post our memory at its rated 3200 megahertz speed. Why am I pointing? The memory's on the other side. Uh, and at the time of testing, we used the latest Wickle driver from NVIDIA, that's 398.82. I tested six games at three different resolutions, giving you a total of 18 benchmarks today, and all the titles were pretty much run at ultra settings across the board. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and see what this little guy's made of. Here are the benchmarks. So I don't think any of us are surprised to see this thing absolutely murder 1080p gaming. In fact, all of our titles got 60 FPS or higher on average. In fact, a lot higher in most titles. Uh, I would say three of the six games were 144 hertz ready even, um, ranging anywhere from one to 200 frames per second. We actually hit the, the, the FPS cap, I believe, in Doom and Overwatch. This also leads us to believe that this thing is fully capable of handling ultra wide resolutions like 3440 by 1440, since that's really not a huge pixel jump over its 16 by 9 counterpart. And finally at 4K we saw 60 FPS on average in all but one title, that one title being Ashes of the Singularity because it's kind of a dick, but for the most part 4K 60 FPS ultra settings in the size of literally half a shoebox. I am absolutely floored by the performance and just sexiness of this mini ITX PC. It's definitely my favorite small form factor build that I've ever assembled personally to date. And you guys let me know if you agree or if you think it sucks and why and all that stuff. Comment, like, subscribe, blah, 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 blah. Check me out on Floatplane for three bucks a month if you'd like to watch all my videos a whole week early without ads. I'll put a link for that in the video description. And thank you so much for watching this video. Have yourselves a good one, guys. Stay tuned for more stuff on the way and I'll see y'all in the next video.